Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining. We are on part two, the final part of this two-part series, and we're going to give the audience a moment to join. So we will get started at the two-minute mark, where I will introduce Nikki, our speaker today. And until then, hang tight, and we will see you in just about one more minute. All right, everybody, it's time to get started. I just wanted to say real quick, if you have any questions about human intelligence, you can reach out to me directly at vita.sternberg at humanintelligence.com. Or if you have questions during this webinar, please feel free to use the GoToWebinar questions queue, and we will set a time aside at the end of the webinar to ask those to Nikki. So without further ado, Nikki, thank you for being here today. Thank you for this two-part series, and I'm gonna let you take the reins and get started. Thank you, Vita. Hello everyone, if you were here for our first session, welcome back. And if you're joining us for the first time, I'm delighted to have you with us. I believe there'll be a recording available for people who weren't able to attend the first one. Now in my first session, we addressed how I'm able to gain trust rather quickly with specific individuals in a coaching setting when people are looking to gain traction quickly. In this session, I'll be addressing how I help teams cut through many of the misunderstandings and misconceptions that may prevent them from operating from a place of trust. Now, for those of you who were here two days ago, please bear with me as I go over some of the groundwork again for those who are joining us for the first time. So I'll start with a brief introduction. My name is Nikki Kagan. I am a corporate facilitator and leadership coach. I began my business in 1996 in Boston doing strategic planning for executive teams. Two years later, I moved to Israel and began serving clients in both countries, which grew to 19 countries around the world and began my focus more on team and leadership development. My clients come from a variety of sectors, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, obviously, there's a heavier demand in the IT because of the industry's rapid growth and because of the young workforce and so forth. I've also authored a book entitled Instinctive Leadership and have been featured in a variety of publications. And you'll see one here in the corner is entitled Bring Your Horse to Work, which is uh, about my, my outdoor experiential program where I bring leader, leadership teams to work with horses. Let me share with you uh, some of my clients. So you'll see here, uh, you can switch it, Vita. You can see here in the green, uh, that represents the categories of clients, and I'll share some different examples from uh, the examples I shared a couple days ago. So for example, eBay. I worked with several eBay teams to help them examine and improve their accountability for results. And as you'll see later, trust is an integral part of building accountability. Harvard, as with MIT, I conducted a 360 for key IT administrators by interviewing their stakeholders, synthesizing the feedback, and then developing a coaching plan based on their results. Amdocs has been a client of mine for more than 20 years. I've spent it developing leadership and management capabilities for uh, team leaders, for mid-level management, all the way up to senior executives. Teva Pharmaceutical is another one of my clients. I've worked with their R&D teams, with finance, done some executive coaching, but one finance engagement stands out because it was explicitly about building much needed trust across a global team. So what I'll be sharing with you today is based on my experience with these clients. And in fact, one of the case studies for today, one of the two case studies we'll be talking about comes from this group. Now, like may, for many of us, my work has evolved over time. And as I said, mine is focused now on leadership and team development. And as I mentioned on uh, Tuesday, when I speak about leadership, I'm not referring specifically to the C-level, but anyone who is in a position to lead or manage. So the session is probably of most interest to a variety of groups. 
Um, but those who see what I call the writing on the wall, who really get the importance of trust. So department heads who are struggling to achieve their targets because their people aren't working as collaboratively as they could be. Or CEOs who recognize that there's a significant challenge these days in building and maintaining the kinds of relationships that they need to thrive and grow, often through digital communication platforms like Zoom, Teams, WebEx, et cetera. Learning and development leaders who understand better than most people how very important trust is when it comes to creating that critical link between learning, development, and performance. And then, of course, all the HR professionals out there who are always looking for a better way to help their managers not only diagnose, but address performance issues. Now, for all of these groups, trust is the common denominator because we're looking to impact motivations and, of course, behavior. So talking about the value of trust, we all know that trust is critical. So Vita, if you could proceed to the next slide. Uh, Stephen Covey's book, The Speed of Trust and Smart Trust. One more slide. Thank you. He explains that trust is a hard economic driver for every organization. Now we all know we need to feel trust personally, we need to experience it professionally. And although we talk about it freely and we all recognize the importance or say we do, we can still find it elusive and hard to, hard to build and maintain actually. So I wanna share with you some evidence that speaks to the power and the importance of trust. So let's go to the next slide. Thank you. So studies in the United States report that high trust organizations are 250% more likely to be high performing revenue companies compared with their low trust counterparts. And a study was done in 2016 by Bart de Jong and his colleagues. They ran 112 studies that included nearly 8,000 teams, and they identified a positive relationship between intra-team trust and shared goal achievement, which to me is really not surprising. Now, there's, there's something called the 100 Best Companies to Work For that's produced by the Great Place to Work Institute, along with Fortune, and they were quoted as saying, trust between managers and employees is the prime, primary defining characteristic of the very best workplaces. Now, that's kind of the umbrella. I want to share with you some specifics. So if we can go to the next slide. Harvard Business Review, Gallup, Sherm, Accenture, Accenture, they all report that trust enhances teamwork and collaboration. It improves organizational alignment. In other words, people are more likely to work together to achieve the same goals. It improves efficiency, engagement, productivity, saving US companies up to $500 billion a year. Obviously, it enhances decision-making, decreases burnout and stress. They say that employees who trust their employers are 74% like less likely to feel stressed and 40% likely to end up being burned out. It increases loyalty and retention. Accenture says that those who are burned out are two and a half times more likely to leave the company. Helps overcome resistance to change, improves innovation and creativity. Research again shows that higher trust means employees are 23% more likely to offer ideas and solutions. These are very compelling statistics. So my point here is that trust is much more than a buzzword. Next. Thank you. So according to the new Edelman Trust Barometer, which if you've not heard of it, it's a survey of 33,000 people in 28 countries. They found that trust goes down when you look at the top positions and go to the lowest positions in companies. So for example, while they found 64% of executives stated that they trust their organizations, that number drops to 51% for managers and 48% for staff members. What does that mean? It means that the higher up you go, the more critical it is to build trust with those beneath you, which means that, the st that trust building starts with the leaders. And I have to tell you, in my opinion, 64% is not high enough. So even with all this evidence and all these statistics, unfortunately, far too few take it so seriously. Next. So despite this compelling evidence, 
leaders still continue to underestimate the damage of low team trust. And you can see here some of the statistics as well. They struggle with how to build it because as we said earlier, building trust comes from predictability, which is the result of one's experience over time. And if you're thinking that the concept of trust is an intangible, you may be surprised to learn that there is a scientific component to it. Next. So Harvard Business Review, the neuroscience of trust, shares that building a culture of trust is what makes a meaningful difference in the bottom line. Compared with people at low trust companies, those at high trust companies report significant statistics, and you see them here, 106% more energy, 76% more engagement, and the list goes on. So in 2001, Paul Zak derived a mathematical relationship between trust and economic performance. Decades of research led to the finding that whenever oxytocin, you know, that feel-good chemical in the brain, gets stimulated, trust is higher. But the most interesting part is what does it take to stimulate oxytocin? So, well, first of all, trust is not an absolute. There are three states in which, within which we can feel trust. The first one is when we expect that someone will behave in a predictable manner. The second is when we're able to let go of the need or the desire to control what someone else is going to do. And the third is when we're willing to be vulnerable, like when we open ourselves up to someone in good faith, knowing that we're going to be safe in their hands. So willingness to be vulnerable, however, also depends on a few things. It's not so easy. I'm not sure how many of you have ever heard of the trust model by Meyer, Davis, and Schumann. Well, they discuss three elements that have to exist before we allow ourselves to be vulnerable. So we allow ourselves to be vulnerable when we think that someone has the ability, which is the knowledge, the skills, the competencies that deem them to be influential or knowledgeable in a specific area. When they have integrity, meaning that they're on the same page with us about our principles and values, the ones we hold near and dear. And the third one is about benevolence. In other words, the extent to which we believe that person wants to do good for us. It's about caring about us, not having a vested interest or a self-interest in the outcome, looking to benefit or gain for themselves in the relationship. So as you might guess, building trust takes time because it depends on our history with people. But there are ways that we can speed up that process, which is what I'm here to talk to you about today. So take this example of this guy with a bow and arrow in his hand, and he is uh, shooting a, a, this, an apple sitting on this woman's head. And uh, if I was to ask you, how many times would you want to see him shoot that apple before you'd stand up there with an apple on your own head? You know, maybe never, but certainly many, many, many times. So the old way, as we said, is generally based on historical actions because there's predictability with history. But that can take a lot of time to build. These days, we don't interact enough with some of the people with whom we need to trust. And for example, working remotely. And then there are people who just by their very nature are less revealing, less open than others. And that takes more time to get to know them. Or there are people who are kind of spontaneous. And maybe we even view them as reckless or uh, unpredictable. And people who behave cons inconsistently, in our opinion, may bump up against our need for that predictability and uh, makes it difficult to build trust with them. So again, this image, this is evidence about how, about how we sometimes need to have that history before we will dare to let go. But it doesn't have to be this way. There are new ways now to gain trust. Today, today we have the technology, we have tools to help us gain insight into other people. And my clients often tell me they feel very safe with me because they trust me to give them kind, honest feedback. They trust that I have their best interests at heart. There's the benevolence factor I spoke about. And that's because I meet them with a sense of who they are. I know what questions will help them and how to gently raise their own self-awareness. So it's not me telling them what they need to know. It's me opening the door so they can take a look in and see what needs to be seen. And that information comes largely from a specific tool that I use. It's one that helps me quickly and efficiently gain people's trust. And gaining trust is now much more important than ever before. 
And that tool I'd like to share it with you. It's a tool uh, from a company called Human Intelligence. And it's the one that I use that helps me gain perspective with my clients quickly. I like it for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's simple yet comprehensive. But most importantly for me, it's not prescriptive, meaning it doesn't define people and put them in a box or a category by a color or by letters or uh, some other category, but rather it creates a platform from which me and my client together can explore their behaviors, their motivators, their energizers, their values based on their preferences or what I like to call inclinations. So with this tool, I can get a holistic view of the entire team, no matter how big they are. Uh, but before I start, I want to tell you that I facilitated an online session with a particular team without prior to using the, the HT tool. And a few of them said that they wanted to start sharing some feedback face to face with a little prompting, but they agreed to do it. Most of the others said no way. Well, once we got started, some of the others saw the value and they wanted to participate as well. So as beneficial as those face-to-face -face sessions are, and they are valuable, I felt that the tool could really help them better understand each other, building knowledge, predictability, and trust. So let me tell you about this team as the first of two case studies. Next. So this was a European sales team. It consisted of 13 people. They are part of a large global company, and they're remotely located throughout Europe. I've worked with most of the team over the years, but about, oh, well, now it's more closer to about two years ago, they went through some organizational changes that resulted in one of their peers taking over leadership of the team. Now, he's very well respected and very well liked. His approach is what I would call more servant leadership style. In other words, he likes to empower people his team to do what they do best, and he's there to support them and guide them, but he's, he's taking a back seat. Now, some key characteristics of this team, they are a friendly, close-knit group, but not a lot of sharing, brainstorming, or collaboration around work issues. They can be a bit disjointed, off in their silos, each doing their own thing. And uh, despite that, though, they're a very strong performing team in each of their respective regions. But because of their success, the company established for them some steep new quotas. So the team met together. They came up with some creative ways to meet their targets, which included implementing some changes in their work approach. Now, while they seemed aligned in their strategy sessions, defining clear next steps, they had a problem with follow through. And that left the leader feeling concerned, frustrated, and even a little distraught. If you're familiar with that model, uh, it's been around a while, the forming, norming, storming, performing, I'd say that they were performing, but in view of the changes, they kind of had to begin all over again. So the leader invited me to participate in their annual meeting where I learned about their team dynamic and quickly sensed some underlying tensions between uh, some of the members, which was unexpressed. I mean, it was unintentionally expressed, but it wasn't overtly expressed. And it was clear that these tensions were part of their challenge. So I suggested that they try the tool. So the tool really helped people understand what was behind the tension. It encouraged them to be more honest and open, a prerequisite for building trust. It also helped as a diagnostic to determine the, the team's key motivators, their behaviors, and their values as a unit. Now, this team was looking for answers as to why their well-intentioned next steps never came to fruition and believed that having a greater understanding of their composition would provide them some valuable, valuable insights, both individually and as an entire team. So ultimately, their collective results did help them understand what holds them back, how to let go of blame, and what needed to change to, uh, to uh, gain traction. So I want to start by sharing with you their personas. So if we can go to the next slide. So personas are the proverbial hats we wear when we're working with others. Now, here we're looking at the team holistically. We see the entire team here, considering how these personas play out for them as a whole. It's much easier for teams to address the full team to look at the whole group together than it is to pick out certain individuals. They understand in this way that nothing's personal and that it's all about uniqueness. 
So we can quickly get a sense of this team's predominant traits, which helps a great deal when it comes to how they communicate. So I'm going to speak to a few of the predominant personas because we'll see them play out as we go through other areas of the assessment. So for example, if you would click Vita, we can see that 38% share the persona of Maverick. Now Mavericks tend to follow a deep sense of personal direction. They tend to challenge existing methods. They find new ways to do things and they like to share the big picture. Now, People who are Mavericks feel proud that they're Mavericks. They like that. But it is important to realize that being a Maverick may make you less of a team player. Now, if you'll click again, Vita, I, I want to show you, you see their score under team player, zero. None of them have the persona of team player. We also see that 38% of them are architects. That's up in the upper left-hand corner. Now, architects are very good listeners, and they appreciate kind of a controlled, predictable, workplace where things are well planned. This definitely describes this group. Now below, we see that 31%, which is still significant, wear the supporter and creative hats. It's down in the pink in the lower left. But as a sales team, you might expect to see higher percentages in go-getter, deal-makers, dynamos, results drivers. And if you look at those scores, they're either extremely low or non-existent. So just from this one page, you can get a sense of what this team's challenges might be. Now let's go a little bit further and look at their behaviors. So behaviors are how people do things, and of course, they're observable. This is big when it comes to trust because our trust in others is largely driven by what we see, what we observe. So let's first look at deliberate versus decisive. So you can click if you would, please. Um, now being deliberate is about taking time to things, think things through, to mull it over. And, and uh, it comes from deliberating, if you're deliberating before you take action. Now decisive is about taking quick action, prompt decision making. So you can see that there's a very wide spread here. Now what's noteworthy is that range um, across the two, although the average, I, don't, I think you can see it, right in the middle there's a little purple uh, vertical line. That's where the average is for the group. Now this range, this spread that we see, might make it hard for some team members to relate to each other, creating a real potential for tension and even failure, especially when they distrust someone's behavior because they don't understand it. So let's look at another aspect of behavior on the next slide. Next one, Vita, okay. So here we see a team strong in both steady and free form. If you could click. Thank you. Now the steady behavior indicates that this team takes comfort in routine processes, which is something I mentioned earlier. That may make implementing new approaches kind of tough because change is likely difficult, it disrupts routine. In other words, spontaneity is likely not this team's strong suit. It's not so easy for them to shift gears and gain traction in a hurry. Now their freeform score reinforces the wide range we saw in deliberate versus decisive. If you could click there. Thank you. They can play on each other's strong behaviors by pushing buttons and they likely do that because they don't understand the behavior, and also they're very forthcoming in sharing their thoughts and their opinions. Now, I'd also like to speak about those two extreme outliers, the uh, uh, under deliberate and decisive. Now, the decisive um, outlier is at 14, almost all the way to the end, and the deliberate is quite high too. So we know how easy it is to judge a behavior as wrong when it's different from our own. Now, outliers can easily impact the full team, depending on whether the team embraces or rejects the outlier's view. So even just by looking at behaviors, we've looked at personas now and behaviors, you can see how these results can help them begin to understand what's behind their struggle to meet new sales targets. And it's easy to imagine how understanding, uh, how understanding what drives those behaviors can increase their trust. Now let's look at their motivators. Next slide. So motivators are people's often unseen values. When we don't know what motivates us to behave in a certain way, 
others are surely let, not going to know either. So it's important to know which motivators will help people achieve a specific goal. If the existing motivators aren't the right ones, it's going to be very difficult to move people. In other words, if you try to move them toward an objective for which they don't feel the right motivation, success is either going to be short-lived or lost. So you may have heard of Dr. B.J. Fogg's behavioral model. In his model, he describes behavior as a product of three things, motivation, ability, and some kind of prompt. And when these three are present together, we get the desired behavior. But we need the right motivators when we're looking for a specific outcome. Now let's look at knowledge and practicality. If you'll click here in the center. They love gaining new knowledge for knowledge's sake, whereas practicality is about acquiring the knowledge you need for a specific purpose. This is another indication of their predisposition to mull things over rather than digging in and moving forward with traction. Let's also look at financial security for them. If you click here. So for many salespeople, you know, financial compensation drives them. This group, however, is more motivated by being of service. Now that's great, but it needs to be coupled with creating business partnerships that are financially lucrative for both the company and the customers. And then we look further at belonging. Belonging is also low. This team is not very driven by a need to belong. The high percentage of Maverick uh, that we saw in the personas supports and reinforces this. Because they need to work together to implement new key initiatives, this is a challenge for them. Now let's move on to their energizers. So the energizers describe the environment in which people are able to do their best work. What stands out here is obviously a creative environment. You see most of the scores are on the right side where they can problem solve. You can see their high percentages for new solutions and variety. They don't seem energized by working together. They're low in working with people. You can click there, uh, you'll see it in circles, which helps explain why collaborative work is a struggle for them. A higher score here would probably make it easier for them to develop deeper customer relationships as well. Knowing this helps them place a greater focus on both customer and colleagues and their relationships. We know that they love turning new solutions into action. We know that they love to plan and they appreciate routine processes. But if that routine starts to cramp their creativity too much, which may happen during an implementation phase, they may struggle and find that they need more structure and support. These were all major epiphanies for this team, but I want to share one more observation. Next slide, please. While they thrive on creativity and freedom, it's clear that they still need some structure. And as I said earlier, their leader takes a more servant approach. He gives them a lot of independence rather than being too hands-on. The insights that we discussed were extremely helpful because he understood that, that they needed more guidance, more direction, and more support. In other words, more structure. Now, I recall one conversation I had with him in which he was really disturbed because of the way one of his direct reports was behaving. I said to him, well, why don't you talk to him? He said, well, I don't know. I'm concerned that he might not take it well. I don't want to upset him. But I convinced him and he had the conversation and he was extremely surprised, pleasantly surprised, because not only were the words well received, but there was an immediate behavioral change. He provided that framework and he was very structured in his approach. What he learned from all of this is that his team doesn't make quick shifts easily. He knew it before, but now he understands the why. He knows that they do well when they can follow a well-planned, consistent set of processes, but if they don't have the time and freedom to also be creative, to problem solve, to challenge, and to set new precedents, they can become inert, which is what was happening. So when asked to think of innovative ways to achieve their new targets, they were all over it and they came up with some great ideas, but more specific guidance was needed when it came to process definition and implementation. Once their leader understood that they're motivated, what their motivators and needs were around structure and support, he was able to change his approach and they began to gain traction. I'll share some of their comments at the end of, the, at the end of this process. If you could go to the next slide. 
So they said that they learned to, uh, to freely offer ideas and listen more actively, that they were able to learn to appreciate and then leverage their differences. They could listen more openly and without judgment. They deepened their trust in each other and the process has led to greater insights and faster turnaround times. They discovered that their strength in planning and analyzing can prevent timely execution. And in the words of the leader, doing this work has changed, well, everything. So although we spoke about many aspects about how this team worked, their ability to gain traction came about because of the disclosure that was made possible by this tool and my coaching around the results. Prior to working with them, they were friendly, but not cohesive. I helped them see that their interactions could go beyond the surface to something much more meaningful and productive for both their individual and collective performance. That wouldn't have happened so quickly had they not had the chance to explore so openly and freely their behaviors, their motivators, their engager, in energizers, and their values together. So the result, of course, was a deeper, much more trusting relationship. That's the first example. I'd like to share with you another case study. This is a client who works with a colleague of mine. His name is Charles Barnard. Now this company is a family owned business in Australia. So we just talked about a large global conglomerate and now we're talking about a family owned business. There's a CEO and the two sales managers are all brothers. Now their team recently divided with one team in Sydney and one being a regional team, which was headed by a new sales manager. In some ways you could say that the sales team then is new because they grew from seven to 12 people within just two months. Now their top sales performer was reassigned to the new sales manager. Her performance took a nosedive after that. So in Charles' engagement, he focused on two things. First, helping the two teams communicate better, which is what I will focus on here. And secondly, helping that star performer regain her high performance. Now he conducted a workshop, he provided one-on-one -on -co one -on -one coaching for the star, excuse me, for the sales manager, both were well received. Their team engagement index rose from 5.3 to 7.8, which was near 50% improvement. And they had record sales for five consecutive months despite their COVID lockdowns. So let's look at what the tool revealed between these two teams, forming the basis for Charles' engagement. Next, please. So first we can see that each group has different motivations. First, we'll start with the regional group, which is on the left. They're highly motivated by financial security. If you could click. That includes things like wealth, material goods, resources, tangibles. They likely focus on practical results, setting and meeting revenue targets. Now, they may want to pay more attention to non-financial goals and objectives, like understanding their customers better, aligning more with their colleagues throughout the company. This is just the opposite of the case study we just discussed. They're also strong in belonging also opposite from the uh, case we just discussed. If you could click, thank you. They like teaming. They're eager and willing to support a lot of projects and a lot of goals. They tend to get things done without complaining about it and they're very strong on follow through. The opportunity here for them is to encourage them to step up and take the reins when they have a new idea or a very strong belief. In other words, to be more outspoken. They're also strong in helping, if you can click. That's demonstra demonstrated by their drive to increase the net promoter scores to drive customer engagement. Now, let's take a look at the Sydney group on the right-hand side. So the Sydney group is also motivated by helping, strong drive to help others, natural, naturally aligning to serve customers both internally and externally, but they may be guilty of giving away too much of their time and talent while the, without being aware that that revenue clock is ticking away. They're also motivated by supporting this group. So they look to see how they can help keep projects running smoothly, moving forward. They tend to focus on providing support to make sure those ideas come to fruition. They naturally get along with others to create a strong sense of camaraderie within the team. But the financial mo motivators that help the regional group to upsell and close customer deals are not as strong. That's so you can see the two differences between the teams. Now let's look at their behaviors next. You'll see both teams favor a steady work pace. If you could click. They're working to, to deliver consistent results. 
Both teams likely excel in routine projects where planning and follow through is key. But the opportunity is to strategize around how to increase their spontaneity, to respond when urgent actions are needed or when they have to address quickly competing priorities. These are some focus areas for their work. Now we also see Freeform, if you'll click please, in the regional group on the left-hand side, which speaks to how they view rules, regulations, procedures. They tend to take initiative when it comes to identifying, pushing, developing new procedures, or when expressing their opinions. The question is whether they take some unnecessary risks around quality as a result of that. This is a remote team, however, so it is more typical than a local team. Now, the Sydney team also scored high in deliberate, which describes their approach to problem solving. They all tend to be more modest, weighing the pros and cons. The opportunity for them is balancing that need for information with the right level of urgency. So a challenge for both groups is balancing their uniqueness, their free form, with their manager's more cautious style. Raising that manager's awareness of this was really helpful in driving group cohesion and satisfaction. But what stood out, one of their key objectives was to help them all become more cohesive by increasing disclosure. In other words, facilitating trust and helping that top performer re Anecdotal feedback was that the team members began engaging with each other much more than before. The sales manager learned that he needed to adjust his approach depending on who, with who he's interacting. The tool really helped. This was critical since this process was unfolding during the first phase of, of the COVID lockdown. He needed close interaction with some people and perhaps less with some others. As I said earlier, the team engagement rose near 50% from 5.3 to 7.8 on Office 5, which is a team development platform. This engagement was followed by a request from the CEO to work with production. The team has since had a group debrief and a, and a communication workshop. The production manager is getting coaching on how to uh, motivate certain team members. And I want to remind you, the company enjoyed five consecutive months of record sales despite being in lockdown. So the results that I've just shared for just two examples demonstrate how both behaviors and bottom line numbers are positively influenced by building that strong foundation of trust. Next, I don't know how many of you have heard of Patrick Lencioni, but at the end of the day, remember, none of us work in a vacuum. Our accomplishments at work are the results of the collective. And as you see in this model by Patrick Lencioni, featured in his book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, the foundation of teamwork is trust in all of its forms, communication trust, competence and capability trust, personal and relational trust, commitment trust, and likely there are more. Now, what he says is if you don't have that foundation of trust, you are not going to have healthy conflict. And healthy conflict is characterized by complete transparency, everybody putting their cards out on the table. If you don't have healthy conflict, you are not gonna get commitment. People are going to hold back and they are not going to be fully committed, even if they don't, even, uh, even if they don't, uh, even if they, they pretend they are, they're not going to always say that. If you don't have the commitment, those people who are not wholly committed are not going to hold themselves accountable. And if you don't have accountability, well, who's going to be focusing on the results? So the trust is the, is, the, is the underpinning of everything. Now, my work as a coach and corporate facilitator is to facilitate the conversations people need to have, both with themselves and with each other, conversations that help them leverage their best thinking and grow their businesses. But there are two things that are often downplayed or overlooked by other leadership development approaches in my experience. And the first one is self-awareness. So as leaders and managers, we have to first become self-aware, which includes knowing who we are, how we are, and why we are, and then working to either close the gaps or navigate around those gaps. Once we raise our own self-awareness, it's that much easier to become other aware, which is critical when you're going to be leading people. The second is the element of trust. Trust is what greases the skids, as they say, making everything else easier. 
If you consider how much time is spent on misunderstandings, making sure no one messes things up, worrying about what happens if we give away our knowledge, I hear that one a lot, it becomes clear just how critical trust is. So I begin all my engagements with the HT tool because as I've demonstrated, it speeds up that trust process and levels the playing field so the right conversations can happen. Now, I'd like to give you, those of you who are not here uh, two days ago, I'd like to give you also the chance to try this for yourselves. Next, please. So all you have to do is just scan this QR code, or if you prefer, you could email me for the link, and actually Vita put the link in the, in the chat for you. And I'm also offering a complimentary hour-long coaching call for the first 10 people to take advantage of this. Now, the way it works is this. Once you complete the assessment, it's very quick. It should take you maximum 15 minutes. You will get imme immediate results by email. I'll be notified that uh, you've taken it, and I will reach out to you to send you a link to schedule your coaching session, during which time I can help you maximize the benefit by helping you interpret your assessment more deeply and to answer any other questions that are on your mind about the process, about the tool, even about your work. So it'll give you a great opportunity to experience firsthand how much you can learn about yourself and then extrapolate that to the team, and it's really a great way to get, get started. So um, before we move on to questions, I just want to say whether you've joined me for the first time or you were with us a few days ago for the first session, I'm really happy that you participated. Vita, you can move on next. I hope that I have driven home the importance of cultivating trust within your teams and the importance of both self and other awareness to team success. I encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity to try the tool, and I assure you that both the assessment as well as your call with me will be a worthwhile investment of your time. So at this point, I'd like to open it up. Uh, Vida, you can move on to the next slide. Uh, I'd like to open it up for any questions that you might have about the tool. Uh, we've got an HT expert on the line uh, about the process, whatever, whatever you like. So I'd like to open it up to questions now. Great, thank you so much for the second half of the webinar, Nikki. I found it super helpful and interesting, and I just wanted to thank everybody for joining as well. And you're welcome to follow the link in the chat, or if you need that QR code, just reach out to me after we finish the questions. So for those of you still on, please put those questions in the queue, and I'll read them to Nikki. I know we already have one from around the middle of the presentation that I will read out for you. So Nikki, the question reads, what objections do you get from HR or business managers to your process, and how do you answer how do you answer those objections? Well, uh, it's th thank you. That's an interesting question, and actually, I find that I don't get so many objections. One I get is that it, about the lack of scientific proof, but I have to say there is a lot of science behind this tool. First of all, and second of all, it's uh, it's not very time consuming. As I said, it takes a maximum 15 minutes per person to complete the assessment. There are no in-depth meetings or interviews that need to be set up. And the initial results that describe the team status are delivered pretty much immediately. For the price part of it, because that could be another potential uh, concern, it's very affordable to complete the assessment and get the analysis. My time investment is minimal, which is part of why it's so cost effective. And then, does it work? Well, I have to say the results speak for themselves. As I mentioned, the first case study was my client. The second was one of my colleagues in Australia. We both are getting great results, and our clients truly appreciate the value. So the best way to respond to that is by sharing examples of, of uh, clients for whom uh, it's been extremely successful and talking about both the time and the, the cost, which are both minimal. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Okay, great. And I am seeing one more question here, which is regarding if you're lucky enough to be one of the first 10 registrants and get a coaching session, um, what mm -hmm. can you expect from an initial, co uh, an initial coaching section, session with you? 
uh, that's a good question. So when you, when the uh, when people participate in the assessment tool and get the results, of course you'll be able to read it on your own and you'll get a sense of whether it resonates with you and if there's anything that stands out. In the coaching session, I can help synthesize it and pull it all together. And a lot of times, uh, sometimes people have questions about the terminology and they say, well, this doesn't really accurately reflect me, I don't think. But once we talk about what it means in a broader context, they say, ah, I see what you mean. It also sometimes illuminates challenges that people are having without understanding why. So one of the questions I typically ask people in preparation for that session is first to look it over and, and see if they have anything that stands out, resonates really strongly, or conversely, if there's anything that they feel like, uh, this doesn't really sound like me. And secondly, if they're experiencing any challenges in their professional lives that they would like to explore via the tool. So they can expect answers around those questions. And then if there's something specific going on at work, I'm very happy to relate uh, the results to what they're experiencing and help them help shed some light and help them gain some insight. Well, it sounds Does like a pretty answer? interesting, yeah, I, yeah, that answers the question. I think it's a pretty interesting um, coaching session. So I congratulate those of you who become one of the first 10 who sign up for it um, and get to spend some time with Nikki. I think it will be very beneficial. Um, so those are the last questions that I'm seeing here. I'll give it one or two more minutes to see if anybody okay. has some last questions. But if we have any final sentiments from you or Martin, um, let me know. But otherwise, if you have anybody who's still listening questions about human intelligence, again, you can reach out to me directly at bb.sternberg mm -hmm. at humanintelligence.com. Or you can check out our LinkedIn, which is just human intelligence. And uh, Nikki Kagan is also on LinkedIn if you want to check her out. And I will leave it up to final sentiments. And if we have any questions that come in during that time, I'll ask them. And if not, then we'll wrap the webinar up after that. So, Nikki, let's summarize the uh, two session webinar series. So, I just want to say thank you again for those of you who are joining this time and last time. And I want to just reiterate that whether you're looking for a one on one coaching experience, maybe for some of your leaders or managers, uh, or you're looking to diagnose an entire organization. It's not just limited, limited to teams. This, this uh, assessment can be uh, made available for an entire organization and do a lot of work around culture. So uh, I think that that's important to say that it's extremely easily scalable and that makes it very powerful. Uh, first of all, because it's uh, so, it's so uh, effective from a time standpoint and it it's, won't break the bank. Um, and I also just want to say between Tuesday and today, I've had a number of coaching calls already, really enjoyed them. So I encourage you, once you've taken the assessment and I reach out to you to schedule that call, please don't hesitate. Uh, it can only help. <laughs> if you don't like it, we can end the call early. But I'm quite sure that you'll enjoy it and that you will gain some valuable insights. So really All thank right. you for your time. Great. Well, I will thank you, Nikki, once again for being our speaker over these two webinars and thank the audience once more for joining us um, and look out for that recording coming in a follow-up email. And for those of you who are watching this on the recording, um, if you do have any questions, reach out to us. <laughs> and with that, I will say have a great rest of your day and we look forward thank to you. talking with all of you. Thank you for hosting me, Vita. Thank you very much. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>